Hello and welcome to But the Ads Are the Best Bit, a programme all about the wonderful and sometimes weird world of advertising. A programme created by academics and students at the Media School at Bournemouth University, the place that first developed the very first UK-based advertising degree course 21 years ago. And in today's programme, we'll be reviewing three contemporary advertising campaigns, taking a critical perspective. We'll then be discussing these ads with some advertising students who make up our hit or miss panel. Then taking a look at the hot topics making the news in the ad industry press. And we'll finish today by glancing back many years to see what ad campaigns were salient and what they were saying. More than any other cultural form, it's advertising which gives us some of the greatest insight to, into contemporary society. And for that reason, we're not going to restrict ourselves just to rerunning old favourites on the programme. Although we'll undoubtedly do some of that, instead we'll try to look at ads which have caught our attention because they've got something interesting to say about them. This might mean that on some occasions the ads we look at are a little less familiar than others, but by looking at them we might be able to get a little bit closer to that elusive idea of what a good ad really might be. But we're not just in it for the culture. Not even the Globe Theatre would have gone to a second run of Coriolanus if people hadn't left the first performances muttering, nature teaches beasts know their friends and humming the theme tune. So we also want to know what audiences think about ads. To start, and with a very loose link to political autocrats, and bearing in mind the interesting factoid that Coriolanus was suppressed in 1930s France because of its appropriation by the fascist elements within the country, let's have a look at our first ad. <laughs> This ad was made by the brilliantly named Black River Football Club Agency in South Africa. The ad was rapidly withdrawn following threats to Nando's employees in Zimbabwe by youth groups there that were loyal to Zimbabwe. Nando's have a reputation in Africa for being rather more risky in their advertising, some of which seems to be made with the recognition that certain ads will only air a few times before being voluntarily or forcibly removed from the screens. Also, they've never been averse to a bit of political comment in their advertising. A couple of years ago, they invited the fury of certain sections of the ANC following an ad which mocked Julius Malerma, the then president of the ANC Youth League. This ad was intended for the Christmas period. No one should ever have to eat alone is a message of goodwill and forgiveness, an exhortation to think of others who may be by themselves over the Christmas period. In showing Mugabe alone at his dining table, there's a certain sense of sadness showing a figure who, in his reverie, thinks back to those absent friends and those he once loved. Aside from inspiring the ire of Mugabe supporters in Zimbabwe, uh, the ad has been criticised for making fun-loving figures of some of the most tyrannical and political leaders of recent times. Whilst it perhaps tells us little about Peri Peri Chicken, there's a sense of pathos about the figure of Mugabe, and without condoning his past associations, Nando's have produced an ad which extends a sense of a modern version of Dickens' Christmas Carol. More than the usual seasonal exhortation to simply buy more stuff or buy the Christmas version of the stuff you've already got, this is a moral tale about a man who is usually portrayed, in, at least in the Western media, as being himself without morals. There's probably an obvious link between that last thought and the themes of theft, but fortunately I lack the imagination to make it. So instead, let's look at an ad from the Netherlands.
Following in the tradition of the ad industry's on-off love affair with high-modality realist style work, this Dutch ad for LG televisions made by Young and Rubicam in, in Amsterdam is shot from the point of view of an in-store security camera and imagine he exploits one of the virtues of the world's slimmest television. Doubtless, the popular press in the UK would interpret this as another one of advertising's thinly veiled exhortations to start a riot in order to procure the most desirable consumer items at the lowest possible price. Assuming you, are, you interpret a couple of years detained at Her Majesty's pleasure as being a low price. But it's an imaginative illustration of the most attractive virtue of LG's new lootable range of televisions. Whilst demonstrations of a product's qualities can often seem a little questionable and sometimes stage managed, this ad manages to convince you, or that you see, or rather you don't see, the virtues before you see the product. From the point of view of the narrative structure, it holds out nicely before the rev revelation that this ad is really only an ad for television. And it's sufficiently distinctive to make an impact amongst all those dull as ditch water made for television three part dramas that are shown in between the ad breaks. The security camera perspective gives indi the individual sequences a, a sort of field of, of, of vision or depth which is unusual in its detail and helps make the ad rather more durable for repeated viewing. There's also an intensively live feel to the action which means that leaves the viewer wondering whether each time they see the ad will this be the occasion on which the store manager catches the miscreant. In the UK, we tend to pre prefer our thieves, criminals, mobsters and all-purpose hard men as slightly more caricatured and therefore distinguished from the unexceptional looking star of the LG ad. The sort of thing we favour is more like this. There are times in life where being tough comes in handy. Say some geezer collapses in front of you, what do you do? We need a volunteer that ain't breathing. Here's one I made earlier. First off, you call 999. I oh, know. Then, no kissing. You only kiss your missus on the lips. You push hard and fast here on the Sovereign to stay in alive. Remember, call 999. Push hard and fast to stay in alive. Hands only CPR. It's not as hard as it looks. That was a short film from the British Heart Foundation for Hands Only CPR made by the Grey Advertising Agency, starring Vinnie Jones, formerly known to most of the agency as the bloke from the Bacardi ad. In a pastiche that condenses popular cultural references from Blue Peter, The Sweeney, Saturday Night Fever, The Long Good Friday, Reservoir Dogs, reprisals of Jones's own role in Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, Pulp Fiction and Life on Mars, all in all a distinctly British homage to Quentin Tarantino. The ad doesn't simply articulate a simpler Britain of the 1970s and 1980s where if a geezer got a bit leery, you'd give him a right hander. But it recalls something far more important to us, a chance to revisit our televisual past, our past that never quite existed in the first place, but that we yearn to return to. And here's our opportunity, and you can break a couple of ribs in and do somebody a favour into the bargain. The elements of the piece are brilliantly constructed. The beatbox with the minders grooving along, the homoerotic subtext underscored by Jones's assertion that you only kiss your missus on the lips, before he's revealed to be the hard nut with a heart of gold. The most exceptional thing of all, it's so simple. Once you've remembered the instructions to be staying alive, everything else just falls into place. There was almost certainly somebody at Grey who was desperate to make this ad, whether it was going to be for coffee, hair gel, microwave ovens. The levels of care and attention to detail are outstanding. It's somebody's Orson Welles moment. And if this hasn't already confirmed its place as one of Britain's favourite ads in 2012, I'd be very, very surprised. You can almost see Jones cooking down, cooking down Mustafa Ishmael's bathroom door and telling him to put his trousers on, he's going for a ride, as he dislodges him from the nation's affections. As much as the possibility of saving a few lives, this ad is the perfect thumbnail sketch of recession hit Britain, nostalgically looking back to a simpler age and trying to beat some life into the ailing corpse of the economy. Don't pay any attention to all those would-be gritty social realist dramas. They'll just be remakes of Off We Design Pet and Boys From The Black Stuff starring rejects from the cast of Hollyoaks. If people really want to know what Britain was like in 2012, all you need to do is show them the British Heart Foundation's ad. OK, so we've watched the ads and we've heard the considered, the thoughtful, maybe even the analytical views about a series of current ad campaigns filling TV screens in three different nations during the last few weeks. Now it's time to put the ads to an even more robust test, popular, or public opinion with our hit and miss panel. 
Uh, on today's panel we have three students all studying advertising here at the Media School and they are Jim Compton, Athena Dobson and Ed Terry. Um, firstly, I'd like your views on whether that you saw a theme to those ads. David clearly picked them because he thought there was something that meshes them together and I wonder if you saw any kind of overarching theme. Ed? Um, well, I definitely noticed a theme recurring through them, probably of controversy more than anything, um, whether it's with Vinnie Jones, some hard nut saving someone's life, which he never does, or if it's obviously Mustafa and the South African campaign. Um, I felt that in a way they were sort of maybe even trying to get themselves banned. I know that's a common occurrence with the Nando's mm -hmm. ads. Maybe not so much their hands-only CPR ad, but there was definitely a way that they use controversy to get people talking about the ads and sort of sharing them around. Right, so a kind of deliberate edginess to some aspect yeah, of Yeah, I'd them. say so. Yeah, okay, thanks. Athena, what, have you got thoughts? Um, I personally think that there was an element of humour involved with trying to take something that's quite serious and very cynical and actually putting a very light-hearted spin on it, especially the Vinnie Jones um, advert, the Heart Foundation, where something that's very serious as trying to save someone's life was made into um, a song, you know, the Saturday Night fever is quite uplifting and light-hearted um, as well as the Nando's one you're taking people that aren't politically very well liked and dictators and putting you know water guns and things it's very light-hearted it's very spirited mm. so I think that they're trying to appeal to the consumer more by saying we take that spin on it. Mm. So a certain type of humour really in yes. a sense that links the t uh, three together yeah? Yeah. Okay and Jim did you have a another take on those? Yeah I think they all deal with ethical issues and I wonder if that's uh, what has to happen these days if advertising has to do this to make an impact. Right okay thanks very much. Well uh, for me they all raise questions about the so-called proper place for advertising that is mere advertising. How dare ads about fast food have something to say about dictators? What right have people in ivory towers, usually men, got to comment on social unrest and interestingly in the process distort the purpose of protest. And finally, what a moral vacuum we must live in if we need a middle-aged thug and a dated song to incentivise us to help out in potential life and death situations. Um, I'd like to now ask you some more questions on uh, those ads if that's okay. Perhaps if we think about advertising it's often seen as trying to sell, trying to be persuasive. What's your views in terms of, from those three ads in terms of being persuasive? Um, Ed, do you want to kick off again? Um, I would say the main difference, it's quite obvious between those three ads, is two of them are trying to sell a product. One of them is just trying to get you to remember something. In that respect, I think there's one that definitely stands out to me, and that's the hands-only CPR. Um, it's definitely a great way to get people talking about something just by purely making a completely contradictory ad to what we're used to seeing in everyday life. Mm. Um, Nando's, maybe not so much. It would get me talking about the brand, but I don't know if it would cause me to go out and buy more chicken. And the TV, um, yeah, again, I'd talk about the ad, and I love the ad as a piece of creative execution, but I don't mm. know if it's made me any more likely to buy an <coughs> LG television. Yeah, no. So maybe there's a persuasiveness about getting you to talk rather than getting you to buy something. Yeah, definitely. Yeah? Okay. Athena, do you I completely your agree with Ed 100%. Um, I think that in terms of the Vinnie Jones advert, I think that it's definitely persuading people to actually become aware of it. But not they usually um, put on heartstrings with their types of advertising, but this was completely different. Yeah. And it was I think it actually personally made me more willing to, if I was in that situation, take the steps with the CPR. Because it was persuading me to think this is what you actually need to do. Um, in terms of the LG TV, I didn't, I didn't uh, like the ad, but I don't really understand it because in terms of persuasive communication, is their message, it's so thin that you can steal it? Or what is it that they're actually trying to communicate through their message? Hmm. Um, and I didn't really like it. Maybe it's just the first bit of that they would want, I would imagine. They just want you to remember the thinness, yeah, maybe. I suppose so. Yeah, okay. Um, and Jim, what about you in terms of these, pe these ads as pieces of persuasive communication? Well, I think they're all brilliant pieces of entertainment, but I think not all of them are great persuaders. Uh, the LG ad 
is all about uh, building on the benefit of it being th uh, thin. But personally, I don't need a thinner TV, and I think uh, I don't think it's the right benefit for them to have chosen. Um, the Nando's ad, it's brilliant to watch, it's funny, and I think it, it does get you talking, but it doesn't make me want to buy chicken. But the, uh, <laughs> the CPR ad was brilliant, it's about memorability, it is memorable. If you're in that situation, it's easy to do. You'll remember. Yeah. Um, and will you need the soundtrack to remind you to help save someone's life, or will it just come back? It's always going in my head. Is it? <laughs> yes. So that, there is a good example of being persuasive, but not about selling. It's persuading you to remember something important, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, as David referred to in his uh, analysis, obviously advertising is often seen as a kind of a cultural landmark. It tells us something more deep about the society that it's part of. Um, and I wonder, I know it's a difficult question, I wonder if you guys could um, help our audience to illuminate from a South African, from a Dutch and from a British point of view what those three individual ads might be saying about the culture that they're from. Um, so perhaps Ed, if you can talk about uh, perhaps the one we're more familiar with, British society. Yeah, um, I think I'd go back to what David was saying earlier about the whole homage to British culture and TV. For me, it's definitely a strong connection to films like Lockstock, which I've watched numerous times. And I don't know whether that gives me a biased view of whether the ad's a success or not, mm. but I know it only took me all of a minute to share it with another friend on Facebook, and I know it's got over one and a half million views now on YouTube. So it's definitely got that kind of viral capabilities. And essentially, like I said earlier, it's all about just spreading a message. They're not trying to sell anything. Mm. So if their key purpose is to get as many people as possible talking about this new technique, then I feel it was a success. Um, I think another point about it was the soundtrack. They were talking about the Staying Alive soundtrack. I think when I was taught how to do CPR originally in a first aid course, I was taught to do it to the tune of Nelly the Elephant. <laughs> and so I guess in a way it's kind of given me a more sort of up-to-date I wouldn't say relevant, I don't see myself as a kind of disco diva, but maybe a more relevant and more memorable song. And I don't think I would have used the Nelly the Elephant, but I, <laughs> I think this probably would come into my head now yeah, when okay. CPR. That's, that's very interesting, yeah. And just across the channel, uh, we have a, an ad from Holland. What do you think that might have been telling us about, uh, uh, David suggested, a more liberal kind of European culture? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I think this advert is very dependent on where it is that it's actually being filmed uh, or presented to the audience. Um, I think if it was to be shown in London, especially with the current climate and the riots that have very recently happened, I think it would not be accepted at all. And I think it would absolutely be removed by the ASA right. and it would cause so much controversy. However, I think in the Netherlands, I don't think they've had these problems. I think they've got a bit more of a laid-back approach. I don't think that they would think this is going to equal people looting. I think they would think it's just a funny way of showing how thin something can be. I don't think they would see it at all in the same way. Right. So I think it very much depends on the society within which it is shown. Yeah, okay. So less, less literal readers, perhaps, in Holland. Yeah, maybe. definitely. Just more laid back with yeah, their yeah. approach. Okay, fine. And then um, 10 hours away on a flight, South Africa. And uh, Nando's, what do, you, what do you make of that, Jim, culturally? Well, I think it has quite a cultural impact globally. Uh, we're all used to all the news stories about the dictators. But in Africa, it's going to be even more, impact, uh, even more of an impact mm. because they're a lot closer to this. And I think because it's presenting something that is happening in the culture and it's doing, blowing it out of proportion, putting it in a completely different context, it uh, shocks people. It makes a massive impact. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now the bit we've uh, all been waiting for. Why? Because we all love categories and lists and our culture considers personal judgment to be the most worthy. Uh, so it all boils down now to the pronouncements of our three panel members. Were the ads review today a hit or a miss? So hit or miss, what do we think? So for the first ad, uh, the English, the, the British ad, hit or miss? The British one. 
The British one. Hit. 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 We have three hits. Uh, and what about uh, the Dutch television? The thin television. Uh, we just have one change, just not quite as hit. And then the South African and the Nando's. Hit. Miss. Miss. So, that's very interesting. So, Ed, you like all of them. Uh, that's <laughs> interesting. Okay, so there we have it. Uh, let's have a look at, another look now, at the ad that all of our panel really liked. So, Vinny, over to you. There are times in life where being tough comes in handy. Say some geezer collapses in front of you. What do you do? We need a volunteer that ain't breathing. Here's one I made earlier. First off, you call 999. I know. Then, no kissing. You only kiss your missus on the lips. You push hard and fast here on the Sovereign to stay in alive. Remember, call 999. Push hard and fast to stay in alive. Hands only CPR. It's not as hard as it looks. Like most industries, the advertising trade can be incredibly insular. This sometimes borders on the incestuous. Despite being full of people who constantly espouse the cliché thinking outside the box, or its equivalent, muttering it to anyone who will listen at least three times before breakfast, it can often collectively appear to be so narrow-minded that it's unable to see much light beyond the type it shines to illuminate its clients' brands. What stimulates me to say such things? Well, in this week's advertising trade press, there are literally dozens of examples of navel-gazing stories. Here I've selected just four to help get my point across. The subheading says it all. Then it's totally contradicted by the quote from the article they choose to highlight, which talks about the need for compromise and realism. This is an article that suggests for irritating, read memorable, plain myopic, to still believe in that quaintly naive notion that all publicity is good publicity. Just ask the owners of the Costa Cond Condona. An article that recommends the creation of your own virtual world for all brand managers. Clearly the implications here is that the consumers haven't got enough worlds to occupy and worry about, that they want to spend time in your brand's manufactured world. Not so. This feature on Tesco's recent poor performance suggests that I've been mistaken all along. It's nothing to do with the lack of till registers ringing and all to do with, and I quote, poor PR. Hmm, doubt it. But in fairness, and paying lip service to the notion of balance, you do occasionally come across some genuine self-reflective gems. Sadly, we couldn't find any this week. Well, actually, we could, just. Here's a story about women in advertising. When asked, why aren't there more women in top roles in the ad industry, in amongst the clutter of cliches, including one senior person actually saying, I struggle to think what more might be done, or to start with, more outside the box thinking might help. Anyway, a ray of hope too. Nikki from McCann offers a specific solution. Bring the toddlers to the agency. We're well, not quite that, but get Adland to provide crash facilities in Soho, where nearly all the agencies live. It would be a fascinating social experiment but to see how children turn out, having been surrounded by thousands of ad men and women in their formative years. 2012, the year of austerity, oh yes, and the Olympics. Indeed, I lost count of the number of references that position the Olympics as the panacea for promotional activity in 2012. <clears throat> Everything from a relaunch of a relaunch of Cadbury's Whisper through to the event help in, helping to redefine what Britain's all about. Nice to see the hype industry is full of hype. Certainly this mix of potential contradictions, the age of austerity, austerity and the age of possibility is going to be interesting to observe. Just how will the industry manage such contradictions and dilemmas and paradoxes? We'll be watching closely and report back on this in future programmes. This week it appears that the idea that we're all in this together, this being hardship, scarcity and belt tightening, is transformed miraculously by the ad industry, mostly into, into talking about opportunity. 
This is a story of three established and formerly well-paid ad executives throwing it all in to begin afresh by opening a corner shop. Well, in their case, another startup agency born out of the remnants of existing agencies. Although I sincerely wish these three individuals well, the story speaks to a bigger point. The idea that in this most austere of times, Adlan people chuck in their regular five to nine, or okay, eight, ten to eight, to get their name over the door. To be fair to these three guys, they deliberately chose not to call their new agency surname times three, but that's because they have such utter confidence. Talking about the prospects for their new business in 2012, they say, our only hope is that in five years time, we'll still be having a strong culture and intimate conversations with clients. Most other people starting a business would be hoping that in five weeks time, they could still put dinner on the table. Even the meerkats, they demonstrate the fallacy that we're all in this together. <clears throat> this is well illustrated by their latest ad, which sees the boss bringing his loyal employer to a trembling angst as he implies redundancy is on the cards before op offering the far more rewarding prospect of double the work for the same amount of pay. <clears throat> An uncannily accurate portrayal of life for many British workers today. An intriguing issue caught our eye in the latest edition of Campaign. This article ponders the findings published in a book, Bounce, written by Matthew Side. In it, he suggests deeply embedded knowledge and, con and contrasts this to practice. And he suggests that this beats innate youthfulness and enthusiasm, hands down. Industry commentators have mixed views, from trotting out dull cliches about needing a constant breath of fresh air to concerns about the <coughs> profession without sufficient craft. Well, we've put this idea to the test and we asked a random sample of students studying advertising what their thoughts on the issue of experience versus being uber cool meant. Here's some of the responses that we are allowed to air. I think in terms of industry experience versus raw talent, um, considering the kind of uh, industry that advertising is, I think there's a constant need for fresh blood to actually the way technology changes and the way social media, I mean you get somebody that could be the most experienced advertiser practitioner in the world but they might not have been brought up with Twitter, social, social networking sort of things and the digital side of things. So in that respect I do think that there is a constant need for fresh thoughts and fresh imagination just to really keep up with the trends. I think you always need to have new people going into whatever industry it is. Um, because they're always going to bring new ideas and like a fresh approach. Um, I think advertising is a funny one in comparison to other industries because obviously in things like the banking industry as you uh, get older and you progress up you have more influence and more power whereas in advertising it's all based around ideas so I mean a great idea could come from the CEO but it could come from the intern as well so for that reason I think it's really important to keep changing around the staff, make sure that um, new talent does have a voice to talk their ideas, uh, but also appreciate some of the wisdom that people have been in the industry for a long time know. I think experienced older advertising executives might not have their ear to the ground with new technologies uh, uh, as much as a younger student would who's been involved in, in, in that digital world. But experience, I think, wins when it comes to tried and tested methods like TV commercials. I think someone who's spent 30 years making TV advertisements will know a lot more than a student who's just come out of university. Um, so, you know, we need both. We need both to work together. We need both to work side by side. People that are experienced uh, started off as students, started off as people that didn't know anything as raw talent. Um, so I think a mixture of experience and maturity along with an exuberant, innovative young student is a perfect combination for any campaign. 
people that have been in the industry for a long time almost don't have as much to offer in terms of new ideas. They may have worked with their clients for a really long time. Maybe a little bit frightened um, of what to suggest to them um, as they know what's worked in the past and what the client's like. Um, their business is going to be really valuable to them. So in a way, sometimes they can be a bit nervous about what to suggest and where to go. So for that reason, I think, um, especially new young agencies that maybe don't have as much to lose, um, can be really good at offering some of these new ideas. Um, I think it's valuable to have a place for smaller agencies and like fresh blood, um, as to call it, in the agency in, in the ad world, um, alongside some of the big dogs as well. As well, people have these perceptions and these, I actually think they're misconceptions, that students that are freshly graduated or like freshly out into the industry workplace don't have enough knowledge or experience to actually take over the task in hand but um, I think especially with this degree and this course um, we're kind of conditioned into having an agency mindset and um, actually working with the, the new trends it's nothing from a textbook from the 1940s it's all current it's all now and I think this is something that sort of actually prevails over people that have been in the industry for I don't know decades I think this is one of the major strengths that fresh talent has. So not surprisingly, most young people think youthful enthusiasm is the most important. Well, as somebody who's just the wrong side of 40, I disagree. David, what do you think? Well, in an industry like advertising, you need a degree of gusto, energy, um, a little bit of enthusiasm, a little something to carry you through, but... Over 40? On reflection, I can't help but feel that I agree with George Bernard Shaw when he said that basically youth is wasted on the young. However, with the dim and distant past in mind, let's look back. Let's look back to a piece of wordless genius from the Collett Dickinson Pierce Agency in That was directed by Keith Hewitt and the creative team were Frank McCone and Mike Savino. The Collett Dickinson Pierce Agency of course gained great popular acclaim or perhaps notoriety for their well-known surrealist prints and Hedges advertisements during the 1970s. Although this ad, dating from 1963, predates the ban on cigarette advertising by two years, it does seem to be very self-consciously restrained, perhaps as a reaction to the Royal College of Physicians calling for an end to cigarette advertising the year before. The style of the ad recalls the opening graphic sequence of something like a mixture of Raffles and Danger Man. Rather than spelling out a string of product benefits, it produces a first-person perspective on the joys of pillaging old world sophistication with a jovial deftness articulated by the Jacques Lussier trio three years before they infamously blew smoke over Bark's G-string. Judging from the antique desk, the globe, the table lighter, who on earth remembers table lighters? The victim isn't going to miss her diamonds half as much as she's going to miss her Bensons. The only very slightly disconcerting aspect of the work is that the light source suggests the protagonist was wearing a head torch. That would probably have spoiled his image. But basically, this adds a love scene. It's the moment where Humphrey Bogart grabs Lauren Bacall roughly around the shoulders and draws her into his embrace. At first she resists, then she melts into his arms, yes. There's possibly a hint of a misogynistic subtext in there, but this was an incitement to go out and steal cigarettes any more than it was an incitement to go out and commit unspeakable acts. The unspeakable black now, of course, would be lighting the cigarette. But this is the optimistic fantasy of a Britain in the 1960s. In my opinion, this is 60 seconds of wordless advertising genius. Let's just take one more look. <laughs>
Well, those comments were brought to you from a man who gets through at least 40 cigarettes a day. Remember, not to flick channels between programmes, or somebody with a lot of common sense is likely to complain. But the ads are the best bits. So see you next week.